Are you Elif? No, I'm, I'm helping Elif today. Oh, okay. He's not here today. I'm oh, sorry. okay. Oh, okay. Uh, you can go ahead, Bill, if you'd like. Today is Wednesday, January 30th, 2008. I am H.F. Williamson. I am interviewing Philip Juck for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center at Studio X, Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Lighting, Sound, and Camera. Good morning, Phil. Morning. Perhaps you could start out by telling us where you were and what you were doing when World War II broke out in the background before you entered the service. Okay. Uh, maybe I should back up even to give Certainly a little may. bit of background of my uh, parents and the so forth. Because my father had been in the First World War as a hospital corpsman, and he had seen all the kinds of problems that arise, if you want to call them problems, uh, battles, artillery battles, and then he would go up there and pick up the pieces, so to speak, in this hospital train, and he did that for two years. And so he had a very a vivid uh, memory of that, and he was a very good storyteller. So I had heard all kinds of stories like that. So that when the uh, draft was initiated, and you get the draft at 21, then uh, he said, well, you're only 14 or 15. You probably won't have to worry about that. So now we're back to December 7th, 1941. I'm a senior in high school. Back up even a farther step. I, my mother was a school teacher, and so I had learned how to read when I was about four or five, and we were a mile from the country school that I went to, which is uh, uh, northern Minnesota. And so they said, well, don't go to school until after, uh, say, about April. So April, I went to first grade when I was uh, five. I just turned six. And so I was in the first grade for about a couple of weeks, and then the next year I was in the second grade. Well, along about uh, when I was in the sixth or seventh grade, then I ended up in uh, the next grade up because I was the only one in the grade. There's only 20 some in the school. So I ended up then being 11 years old and in the eighth grade, and I was a scrawny kid anyway. And so then when I got into high school, I weighed 65 pounds. I was about four feet six, and I was 12 years old. Well, uh, when I was 15, now the uh, war happens, and I thought, oh, well, what the heck. Uh, I'm 15. They don't draft till 21. Whatever's going to happen, it'll happen in the next six years. It probably won't make any difference to me. Well, two things happened. The war lasted a lot longer than people figured, and the age of the draft went down to 18, and so uh, then I ended up with that. So I graduated from high school when I was just 16, went to a community college for two years, and then graduated from that when I was 17, because it was just, I graduated from that the 17th of March. 24th of March, I turned 18, and I'm now for 2C, which is farm deferred, because I lived on a farm. But that only lasted about a month or so, and then I was 1A. Well, 1A means you're eligible for draft. So I said, okay. Uh, I looked in the looked local paper, and there's a little bit of a notice about this big only. It said, uh, take this uh, Eddie test, and you will then be assigned to a radio technician training program, 11-month training program. I thought, oh, well, since my father had described in vivid details what happened when you're part of infantry, and this is what most of the guys that were my caliber, so to speak, were going into. Uh, they uh, didn't, it didn't look too promising from that standpoint. So I thought, okay, I'll try the Navy. So I, I went to the Navy recruiter guy and I said, well, what does it take to pass this test? He said, well, it involves a lot of physics and electrical engineering and mathematics and that sort of stuff. Now, I'm a country boy with high school education. My mathematics was geometry. That was it. Anyway, so now I, I brush up a little bit and take the test, and I'll be darn it past it. And they only took the top percentage of the high school graduating class in the first place to take the test. You couldn't just take it for anybody. So I passed it, and I'll be darned. Uh, and only 5% of people passed it on top what of that. Was, what year was this? This is 1942, 44. No, 44. I'm 44. I, anyway, so I, 1944. And so I thought, okay, so they said, don't come now. Don't come to the, the drafted. Uh, wait until we tell you when to come. And so then not until January of 16, 
1945 did I actually go and be inducted into the Navy. Well, they put us into a special, uh, what they call RT, or radio technician training program. And they put you into a special group of, in the boot camp because you only had uh, one month of boot camp. Everybody else had about two or three months of boot camp. And so I ended up uh, in Great Lakes in uh, January of 1945. Well, I'd been uh, raised in northern Minnesota, and uh, uh, the day before they actually uh, went into the Navy, the January 15th, it was 20 below zero, and we were skating all day and outside uh, hockey, played hockey all afternoon, and then I went off to Great Lakes. Well, I'd never been to such a warm place in my life. I mean, great. Scott, it went above freezing and stuff every other day. And uh, so, on. well, uh, getting ahead of the story, I was in uh, Great Lakes that year, and then next year I was in San Francisco and Treasure Island, and the next year I was in Hawaii. And I realized then that you didn't have to have uh, go, go oh, freezing uh, in the middle of November, stay snow on the ground till the middle of March, every place in the world, because I'd been in places where it didn't. Anyway, I went into this... Uh, Navy training program, and they put, uh, it's usually about, I don't know exactly, about 90 people in a company, and we were an RT company, and uh, the others that were uh, in the uh, boot camps, they were in three uh, different, uh, uh, they were in different companies. We were in one company, and RTs had three stripes on the sleeves, and because a apprentice seaman has only one, a seaman second class has two, and a first class seaman has three. And we were sworn in the equivalent of a corporal in the Army, as a seaman first class. Your first day in the service, you were already? Yeah, already yeah, yeah, we were already advanced to that because there was a uh, little bit of an uh, incentive. Because, uh, and they, these other sailors in the boot camp would sing songs like, Take down your gold star mother, put up a blue one instead. Your son will never get hurt computing the square root of pi. And it, oh, they went on like that, see. And then we would counter it with saying, they envy our, 60, our thir $44. They envy three stripes on our sleeves. We are the fighting artists. And so, so it was that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, you, you got sworn in first class, which is, uh, it took you quite a while to get that way if you hadn't been. Anyway, I lasted a month there. Then I went to uh, primary uh, training. Uh, which was a weed-out thing. We were uh, stationed at, at Great Lakes for the boot camp, and then I went to Herzl Junior College, which had converted into a Navy training thing. And it was uh, two hours of electricity uh, per day and two hours of, of lab, uh, which meant putting uh, old chassis of receivers together and all kinds of stuff like that, soldering and welding and all that kind of thing. Anyway, that and then two hours of math. Well, they said, well, it's just the... This math is just a, a, a kind of a review. Well, they reviewed all the math I knew in the first two hours of the first day. And after that, it was all brand new. And uh, there was another incentive for this. In addition, I uh, always kind of liked to learn stuff. It was interesting for me to learn. I thought, okay, I'll see if I can learn something besides just being in the service, so to speak. So anyway, there was that incentive. But there was an other incentive, and that is they had a little formula. RT, radio technician, plus FO, fool around, or uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, flunk out, equals RT over H2O, which means after you've been in there for a while, they were sending guys out to uh, be uh, out on the sea, you know, <laughs> over, the, uh, over the H2O. Well, anyway, uh, one of the things that they wanted is drivers for these landing craft, because you needed a lot of those uh, drivers, because... He's the only guy with his head sticking out. So they'd have to have at least two of them on every thing. So anyway, there was this other stick on the other side not to flunk out, plus the incentive to learn something. If you flunked out and went on that, did you lose your stripes? No, you kept the stripes. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, you kept the stripes. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got you kept the stripes for what they're worth. <laughs> if a bullet comes through and takes your head off it. You know, anyway, uh, I, I should... I your stripes. Maybe you could explain the symbol that's on the right shoulder of your uniform. Okay, that's so what they call a ruptured duck. Oh, okay. The ruptured duck is uh, the uh, honorable discharge, I and they sold that into your Thank uniform. You. Yeah, and uh, this is the radio technician third class. ET, uh, they changed it from radio technician to electronic technician uh, third class. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, 
Uh, you, read, you were in school and you had a very strong incentive to do well every week. Yes, yes, yes. And it was completely, completely new. Uh, and I was completely out of my element because most of the guys had had a year or two of electrical engineering and they had advanced math and they had, you name it. The guy sitting alongside of me here, I still remember him. I don't get his name, but uh, I do remember his name, but I wasn't going to say it. But anyway, he uh, had, had his master's in chemistry. And so this is the kind of people that I was competing against, against what I knew about my own self, my own background. And the, after the first day or so, it was completely brand new. We talked about every kind of a mathematics algebra, geometry, trigonometry. We got into integral calculus and differential calculus and wave theory. And uh, you start naming it. Uh, and I'm sitting there two hours a day uh, just being overwhelmed. It's like what the old saying about drinking, uh, taking a drink out of a fire hose. Well, this is the way it was for me. And I thought, well, this isn't going to go so good. So I, and uh, this helped me uh, to think, well, okay, I want to do this. I want to learn, but at the same time, I don't want to go out to sea, so to speak, right away. I'll uh, go off on a tangent here. This then helped me uh, later on when I was an advisor to undergraduate students because I worked seven days a week every waking moment on this, trying to keep into this program because it was going so fast. Uh, I'd never been challenged quite like that because I'd done quite well in all my studies before that, but never at the rate at which this was coming at me. Anyway, when I have a student come in to me and say, hey, Dr. Chuck, would you please uh, drop my me from chemistry because I got 15 hours. Of, I just can't get it, uh, you know, fast enough. I said, okay, now what were you at 6 o'clock this morning? Well, I was in bed. I said, well, how about 7 o'clock? Well, I wasn't up yet. How about 8 o'clock? Well, I don't have an 8 o'clock class. I said, you tell me you're studying between 6 and 8 every day of the morning. You can go out here and drop your chemistry, but otherwise get your rear end out of the door and get to work. Well, most <laughs> needless to say, I didn't have many kids come back to me that way. And uh, it was interesting, too, because I knew that I was completely out of my element in this Navy training program, that if you really worked at something, you could do it. And I worked at, like I said, seven days a week, every waking moment I did this. Well, anyway, uh, there are 44 in this group, and I remember all these numbers. 44 in this group, 21 went on, the other 23 went, da, 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 da. anyway, so, uh, and I had to be the 21st guy. I had to be the 21st guy because I was just hanging on my skin and my teeth. But anyway, then that was first elimination. Now the next one is, we go to what they call elementary electricity and radio material. More of the same, only even faster and more complicated. Go back to Great Lakes for a three-month program. Well, they have a two-week period in which you do this, and then another two-week period, and another two-week period until you finally go. Okay, if you flunk back once, you can repeat. You can repeat it or flunk back. And then you can do this, you can do this once. And sometimes they allow you to do it twice. You can do not the same one, but if you flunked here and then flunked back there. Anyway, uh, they uh, had these steps where you go, and then two ups, and then two weeks, and two weeks. And a number of people did a flunk back, or repeat as they called it. And uh, once they did that, you're kind of panicking a little bit because you think, oh, well, no, I'm going to be out of this program, and that's going to be the end of it. Well, they had a practice sessions before these uh, two-week tests. Incidentally, uh, they were all uh, multiple choices, and they were all machine-graded. And I had learned how to answer multiple choices. There's one obvious wrong one, one obvious misleading one, and then you have to choose between the other. And I think after I did this for about seven or eight months, I could pass a test that I had nothing, I knew nothing about it, <laughs> just on the basis of trying to pick out that. Well, anyway, uh, they gave you a couple of practice tests before. You had to get 70, 7 0 to pass, because sometimes the instructors were a little bit different, so they had to call it a J factor, which equated everybody. Anyway, the first test practice test I took, I got 33. Now, that's a long way from 70. And I thought, oh, golly, what am I going to do? So I went to the instructor and I said, well, what am I going to do? And he said, forget it, you're going to flunk out. I said, oh, not me, I'm not flunk out. So another week went by, another practice test at 55. Hey, I'm doing pretty good, but I'm a long ways from 70. The second time, second week that I took it, I got 7-0. <laughs> anyway, with that, I went on because 
uh, I had been working at it so hard that I was the one now, and the other guys that had been coasting, they, you know, as another example, they said, okay, you can use your, your Navy issue slide rule, or you can buy or take your uh, couple esser, which is an electronic technician type of thing, because it has all the formulas in for impedance and inductance and resistance and all this. It's got all the electrical formulas in there. I thought, well, gee, if I'm going to flunk out, it's going to be $40 for a, a slide rule I'm not going to use. I'll try the Navy one. Well, the Navy one, Navy issue one, is what they derisively called it log log orange crate. Well, log log orange crate meant there were two pieces of wood, one slid inside the other, and a piece of paper with numbers on it written <laughs> on either side. That was the slide rule. Well, I thought, okay, I'll try that. Incidentally, I saved that thing because it was a, a mark. I uh, saved it. It's down in the archive down in Florida State. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an archive down there. Anyway, I saved that thing just as, and I always kept it in my desk. It, that, that reminded me of how it was. Anyway, so uh, I was the uh, 21 first guy. I went on to this uh, Navy training with Bogan, and I then made the 7 0. Well, 7 0. And then from that point on, it got to be easier because everybody else was now getting stuff that was brand new to them as well. And so now I was we're equal again. I had come up to that point. And then from that point on, I made it okay uh, through the training program at uh, Great Lakes, a three-month training program. And I was good at making things. I could weld and solder and so forth. This uh, two-year uh, school of ag that I had attended, community college type of thing at the University of Minnesota, Helped me there, and of course, on the farm, you uh, learn how to make things. I could do, I could do things and make things, and the, that's also important because your uh, electronic technician or radio technician is a maintenance, uh, repair, and uh, installation. Well, you need how to do things too, as well. Not only with your head, but you have to be able to do it with your hand. Okay, so now I'm there, and then they say, okay, and they always give you choices. You can go to Wright Junior College or Herzl Junior College. Well, I picked out Wright. They sent me to Herzl. Then they said, okay, you can go to uh, Del Monte, California, or you can go to Bethesda, Maryland for your elementary electricity and your internet. And I said, okay, I'll go for those. They sent me back to Great Lakes. And then they said, okay, you can go to either Gulfport or you can go to Corpus Christi or you can go to uh, Bethesda, Maryland for your advanced one, your seven week. So I picked out all of those, and they sent me to Treasure Island, California, <laughs> which is always, <laughs> incidentally, afterwards I graduated, I asked for other things, too, and I got nothing that I ever asked for. They just uh, gave you the choice. It's like these uh, thermostats on the wall that are not connected to anything. <laughs> you, you put it in there, and it doesn't make any difference. Anyway, I ended up uh, then uh, going, and anyway, out of this uh, 21, out of the uh, ones that went to Great Lakes, there were only nine went on. So now we, we've narrowed us down from that. And actually, uh, in the overall, and I'm getting ahead of the game here, there were 250 of us that went in about the same time. Only nine guys went straight on through without flunking back at least once or didn't flunk out. And I happened to be one of those nine. And uh, it, mostly just because sheer determination. Anyway, I went to Treasure Island, California, for you get, uh, for you get a month of transmitters, uh, which means you uh, learn how to set up transmitters. And transmitters in the Navy are not little things. I don't know how the one here is for WLL, but this is, these are ones where you walk into the place anyway. Walk into it. You open up the door and walk into the transmitter that, that's that big. And then the next month is receivers, and the next month is radar. Next month is sonar. The next month is fire control gear, which aims the guns and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, and then you do uh, that for seven different months. Well, uh, radar at that time was very secret. The components and the circuitry were all very secret. And so we were all behind very high uh, fences in those labs where we were. Now the uh, barracks where we lived there was, was open, but the places where we did all the classes were all very uh, uh, confined with a Marine guard at the, at the little gate and you had a little badge that let you in and all that sort of stuff. A little aside from that, uh, we went to class from 7 in the morning till almost 5 o'clock. Uh, five days a week, and then six days, the sixth day, we either were on liberty every other week or we had tests every other week. So we were really busy, so to speak. And the Navy has a regular hours, like eight till, say, four, and this all that. Well, because <clears throat> we had uh, these uh, longer hours, we got a break in the morning about 10.30 or so. 
And so we were behind this big high fences with the Marine Guard inside this enclosure and a uh, self-important young uh, officer on the outside said, attention. And we knew he couldn't get in because he didn't have the badge. And uh, he said, attention. And everybody said, looked at him. Finally, they said, you know what you can do with your orders and <laughs> places where you can put that sort of stuff. And all kinds of obscenities, they told him. And he said, okay, you're all on going to be on Captain's Master. And all right, he went on and on. He went down to the gate where the Marine Guard was. And the Marine Guard said, halt. And the guy said, I'm going in there. There's insubordination, and I'm going to put him on report and all this sort of stuff. He said, you don't have the badge. We knew he didn't have the badge, so he couldn't get in. Anyway, <laughs> so the uh, Marine Guard said, halt. And he said, I'm going in. He took a step forward. Marine Guard, which has a club about this long with lead in it, he whacked him on the ankle and broke his leg. <laughs> they hauled him off. And uh, we all just walked over there and watched him haul off. They hauled him off. So anyway, so this is the kind of thing we were, uh, we were in a very uh, confined quarters, so to speak. All our books, uh, which were about you know, like this, about this thick, had all the circuitry for everything. And those were all locked up every night in a safe every night. We... If you wanted to study them, uh, you had to go back in and take special permission and so on. So you better, better pay darn close attention during the day when you got it in your hands. The circuitry and so forth was, was very secret at that time because, uh, well, uh, I'll deviate here a little bit too. The uh, IFF, is identification friend or foe, is a radar uh, triggers a transponder in a plane. It's either you or the enemy. It's our side or your enemy. And it comes back and says, okay, shoot this guy down, but don't shoot this guy down. Well, uh, present commercial planes have the same sort of thing on the, the uh, radar screen. When it sends out a signal, a transponder on the plane will send back the number of the plane so you know who you are and where you are and all that sort of stuff. So that's been it. But at that time, it's very, very highly secret. As a matter of fact, there was no circuitry on it. It was all black and white. Under normal radar, sonar, uh, transmitter, receiver uh, cables might have 20 different wires in it. And each one is color-coded uh, so, so that you end up with one here. You know which one it is at the other end, too, because it's uh, color-coded in a certain way. And that was another thing that they did regularly, is to give you a sudden uh, uh, test for colorblindness. Because if you're colorblind, you are out. There's just no way. Just like you can't be a pilot if you have migraines. But anyway. They did this periodically just to make darn sure because you want to make sure that this is connected to this and not something else. Anyway, so back to the transmitters, receivers, and that sort of stuff. Well, anyway, you did a couple hours of lab, and the labs were usually troubleshooting. They would put bad tubes in or short out something or put a bad component in or do something like that to the equipment, and then you would be... Uh, responsible for getting it uh, fixed, and so uh, I was uh, I was good at that. I really was. I it's a matter of problem solving. You you have the circuitry, and then you can tell what the voltage should be here, or what the signal should be here, or what it should be there, and so you can test it out in a very systematic uh, way. Well, some people weren't as good as others at this. They could do the math maybe, or the electricity they did it, but they couldn't figure out how to solve the problem, which tube was bad, uh, or how to even uh, correct it once. It, so that went on for seven months, all of these kind of things. We were in San Francisco Bay in Treasure Island, and sonar is sound navigation and ranging, uh, which is, uh, is a big uh, diaphragm with a vibrator thing that sends out a signal or listens. You, you've probably seen those things go ping, and then goes out, and it hits the, there, and then comes back. And you learned uh, a lot about acoustics because sonar is sound navigation ring, whereas radar is radio navigation. Sound goes about 760 uh, uh, feet a minute, and, and uh, light goes 186,000 miles a second, and all that sort of stuff. Just so you knew all that. And not only that, but the uh, water temperature and the salinity influences the return. So that if you are aiming this at something, and you are in very cold uh, water, that changes it, the, the distance that you're doing because it's, it's distance and ranging. Radar is uh, ranging and distance, uh, radio distance and ranging. 
it measures how far it is and how far back and tells you where you are. And uh, so that the sonar is not only that, but also listening, so you listen. And you could put the, uh, these heads, as they call them, down into the water and then aim across into the bay, San Francisco Bay. And here's this little water taxi out there, and you could hear the, uh, how fast the propellers go, like that. Or the big ship would go, blink, 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 blink. you could tell, and you can tell almost by the number of revolutions and, and so forth, how fast the ship is going, so that even underwater, you can tell what is going on elsewhere. On the radar thing, uh, because there was this before computers, you had to get uh, the range or what's a relative bearing straight ahead is zero, and then you have the true bearing, which is north and south. You aim the thing, uh, the radar uh, antenna, uh, at the uh, object that you picked up, and then you determine how far you are away from it, and then you do this a couple of different times, and then you determine the range uh, as first, and then the angle, so that you know where they are. So by triangulation, you can tell where you are and where you aren't, and where they are. So you don't want to run into them, or you want to vice versa, or whatever it is. Or you want to, if you want to have control of the fire, the guns, you want to know where the, where the ship is going to be, so you shoot where it's going to be, not where it is. Uh, there's one other thing that uh, I haven't mentioned yet is sh what's called Shoran and Loran. Shoran is short range navigation, and that's triangulation where they had antennas at different places in the world, and then you could tell where you were quite precisely by the, uh, the triangulation there. Well, long range, or Loran, is also that. And these are the precursors of what now GPS is, because GPS goes from the, uh, the uh, satellites. You get a triangulation from there to determine where you are. Well, the Shoran and Loran are what was used to, uh, in some of the uh, later things, to bomb where they use that to determine not the GPS type of thing. Anyway, so that was another thing that we also got involved with in this thing. Anyway, I went through all this, and I ended up pretty close to the top of the class in this uh, thing. And again, out of the 90-some that went into this particular group, uh, only 44 went out of the other end of it, and the rest of them all out to sea, so to speak. An interesting aspect of it uh, that uh, I thought about later, but I didn't think about it at the time, uh, Blacks were only in uh, the uh, cooks or stewards. They were never in anything else. They were, they were always put into those companies or into that position. We had two black uh, fellows in the company that I was in, which is of the, see, there were, I don't know how many exactly. There were 90, maybe. There were maybe a 1,000 or so at, at this uh, uh, radio technician school in Treasure Island. I don't know exactly. I'd have to figure it out. But anyway, there were two, and they were the only two in the whole uh, thing because it, the uh, services at that time were very closely segregated. There was never anything like that. I will add another uh, thing here that's a little bit more uh, pertinent to the the uh, subject, and that is uh, in uh, May of uh, 1945, the European War ended, and uh, there was no celebration. There was no nothing. It was just, oh, the war ended in there. That was the end of it. Uh, President Roosevelt had died. Truman took over. And there were no big things going on as far as I was concerned. Uh, and why is that? I, well, uh, I don't know why or why not. It just wasn't, uh, it wasn't the end, so to speak. Yeah. And, and, and it, was, it had been so drawn out this far. The other thing I was leading up to was that uh, Treasure Island was an embarkation point for uh, the uh, Pacific uh, fleet and the Pacific war, so to speak, the Japanese problem. And uh, the uh, embarkation uh, holding area for these people that are going to go on these uh, ships and boats and so forth overseas is behind a very high barbed wire fence. It's here and over about another five or six feet another one. There's a gap between the two. And 
because I would walk by these guys that are on the other side every time I went to the chow hall, which is hopefully three times a day, there's guys on the other side that are going to go on these ships. The San Francisco Bay has five or six hundred ships in it one day, and one morning you wake up, there's nobody. Another mm -hmm. couple of weeks or so, it fills up again. It's just over and just that over and over and over. Naval personnel? Yeah, these are Navy. Navy, 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 Army, everything. But the only thing on the Treasure Island was, it was the Navy ones mm -hmm. and the Marines. So anyway, uh, they're sitting there about, or standing there about five, maybe at the most five, ten feet away from you, and there's two barbed wire, very high barriers between them. And if you spoke to those guys on that side, they put you on that side until that group left, which might be a week or so. Yeah. Well, uh, that's not very good for your uh, classroom situation because you, 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 next thing you'd be is out to sea with them, right with them, see? <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is rather, uh, uh, I shouldn't say difficult. It was, uh, it was more than difficult. The guys would be out there, you know, lined up every day. Uh, hey, take this, give this note to my wife. Uh, hey, would you, would you mind calling my girlfriend or would you mind, would you mind, would you, anything? Or send this home to my mother. Or anything. You walked right by them because they didn't exist. You did that day after day. Well, this, uh, I don't want to get emotional about this, but this broke you down after a while. <clears throat> uh, because it, you know that those guys, and this was not, uh, they talk about the Japanese going to give up. They didn't give up. Uh, there should be some guys here that really were involved in that in the, that thing. One of the guys, that Jim Corbin, is one of my colleagues, uh, was a beach master, which meant that he was the one that directed the uh, boats into the various places. And uh, one of the islands that they invaded, were 10,000 Marines killed in over a two-day period, and something like 20,000 Japanese killed, and uh, the Bodies were so thick in the water they couldn't get the landing craft up to the shore anymore. And the next day, the water was so filled with maggots that they couldn't get the boats up because the maggots would plug up the water to cool off the engine. Well, those are the guys that were involved in it. And this is no secret that this was, what was going on. So these guys that you're ignoring on the other side there, uh, those are the guys you know that's going to be there. Uh, the scuttlebutt, as they call it, uh, the, which are rumors, and a lot of them are true and a lot of them are not, but uh, enough of them uh, so that you knew that uh, things were not really uh, going well in the Pacific. They had held the Japanese back uh, from uh, completely occupying, say, Hawaii and a few things like that, but it wasn't easy going, going back the other way. Maybe I'll get ahead of this story here a little bit, too, that when they dropped those last two bombs on Japan, uh, it was the happiest riot in San Francisco. You know, there were seven million people, men, on the West Coast ready to go because they were expecting a million casualties. Back up another step. It takes about 20 people to keep one shooting. In other words, for every guy that's shooting a gun, there's about 20, 15 to 20 people back there that are cooks and keeping track of things and putting the shell in, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was one of those guys that was back there. I wasn't in going to be in any danger. Nobody shot at me. Nothing ever happened to me. I didn't shoot anybody. It was all in terms of uh, comparing with people that are actually involved in active uh, battle. My experiences were very anticlimactic. There's a, no big hero. I'm, I'm nothing. I was just one of those guys in the background. But these guys that I'm ignoring here, you know darn good and well that they're going into harm's way when putting it uh, kind of modestly harms away. Heck, you're going to get killed or killed. This is not, you know, this is not a debate or a port contest. This is a kill or be killed. Whoever gets it done better is the one that's the winner. So anyway, uh, I ignored those guys. And uh, then uh, uh, in August, uh, when they dropped the bombs, for uh, 48 hours, the uh, San Francisco and all up and down the West Coast was just one happy riot. Market Street and Mission Street uh, are two very long, broad streets in uh, San Francisco. They turned us loose. And I, I use that word advisedly because uh, they broke all the windows on all the street. And uh, the only thing that I came close to being harmed, and I still have this, is uh, I was walking down the street in, uh, in Mission Street, 
and some it had broken out all the plate glass. Went, there was a shard of glass about five or six feet long, about this big to begin with, and sh going down to the very sharp point. And my buddy and I were walking along, gawking at all this star stuff, and the shard of glass went through my blouse here and between me and that, and I went on to that. And I was gawking as he's walked in. And so I still have this in, the, in this blouse is a place where it's been sewed up because that was as that close as I came, but I could have killed myself. And there were people killed uh, afterwards. Uh, some people were dropping stuff out of the 10-story windows and dropping on people. I don't know if you've ever seen these pictures or not, but it showed from the top, it, all you could see is a sea of white hats and everybody jumping around. Well, when you take a picture at the ground level, there wasn't a sailor with a white hat on. All the other people had the white hats on. The sailors all had the civilian hats on. Uh, they finally shut everything down. Uh, I, uh, uh, I came back onto the base in uh, Treasure Island. And we came back on the base in either two of ways. One was the what's called BART, or Bay, Av Bay Area Re uh, Transport, anyway, regional transport. And that was a train that went on the bottom of the Oakland Bay Bridge. And now that's all, it, that's not, it doesn't exist anymore. They have a, uh, it's uh, cars go one way. And at that time it was a bar. Or you go on a water taxi. Okay, so I went back and uh, things had sort of calmed down. They, the SPs finally cleared the streets and a few things like that. And there was no, there was no malicious damage. It was just happy, happy, happy people. You have no idea the overwhelming uh, thing. And uh, what I'm going to get to is uh, something that I, I still remember. <clears throat> uh, a very drunk sailor is sitting on the curb with a civilian hat on. And for the 30 minutes that I was standing there, the only thing he said was, the war is over, the war is over, the war is over. And uh, that stuck in my uh, mind. Anyway. <clears throat> I still was in school, and they tried then to, because uh, I hadn't graduated, you see, I had only just started there in July, and this now August. And things were uh, kind of uh, uncertain, so they said, okay, uh, we'll continue on. So I, then I graduated in, in January, so to speak. And uh, that's 1946? That's 1946 now, okay. And so uh, I said, uh, okay, uh, whatever. Because I was in, you sign up for the war and the, dur dur the duration and one year. So what, what you do when you sign up. Where I was I'd in like the, to interrupt. Yeah. Have you ever speculated why they made you train on every single item you've mentioned, sonar, radar, and thus not get you out into the ships any sooner? Why couldn't they train you on radar and then become a radar specialist or sonar and then get you out faster because this planning period seems exceptionally long. Uh, one of the problems is you're on a ship and you might be the only technician. If you only know about sonar and the, the, the transmitter goes out, you're in trouble. And so they wanted you to know to be, you can be assigned any place at any time. And I can understand that too, uh, even though I didn't use some of the uh, training, in, in a general sort of a sense, you use all of it. but. Uh, to only know one thing wouldn't be very um, safe, and because they signed you someplace, you were you're an electronic technician, mate. You go and be that, whatever you are. So that's why you were everybody. You do everything to everybody. Maybe you weren't as good at some of the others. Anyway, I. So you graduated. I graduated up for a duration for the year. Yeah, and so they, uh, and so I uh, end up with. Uh, going back to, uh, I, I had to leave, and I went back and forth across the country uh, about three or four times being on leave and liberty. And uh, maybe as long as I'm talking about liberty and leave, I should uh, end it up. I uh, went to the USOs in Chicago, and I went to the USOs in Milwaukee, because Great Lakes is halfway between. They had liberty trains. And uh, that means it's Saturday morning at about 10 o'clock, uh, there'd be a big train there, and you'd I'll jump on it and away you go to Chicago and then there would be 10,000 girls waiting for you and 10,000 parties waiting for you in Milwaukee. Well, I had been in uh, Chicago for the first month and I'd gone to the USOs along uh, Michigan Avenue and so forth. Uh, and so I thought, okay, I'll go to Milwaukee. So I went on the Milwaukee Liberty train and got off there and here's 10,000 girls in the sign. Uh, 
need a party of four, need a party of four, need this and that. And they really treated you, uh, well, we, uh, you go to parties all the time. Well, anyway, uh, then along comes the end of the day. You're supposed to get on this liberty train back at 11 o'clock at night. Well, uh, and you send uh, inspection at about, say, 8 or 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, then get on the train. Okay, so your inspection, you got to have the white on the this and everything, everything your uniform's got to be perfect, everything's all right. Okay, so now comes 11 o'clock, and how comes back drunken, dirty, disheveled, partly uniformed sailors getting back on this liberty train? If anything ever made me a teetotaler, it was that, because uh, I saw more uh, guys that got into more trouble uh, because of, uh, well, the old saying about they go on liberty or leave looking for bad women and good whiskey, but not necessarily in that order. Anyway, so that's what the, the uh, Liberty Trains did. Uh, I had all kinds of experiences uh, with uh, Liberties in Chicago and Milwaukee. Now, keep in mind, I'm a little country boy that's never been out of Minnesota or been in any town bigger than St. Paul, Minneapolis for maybe an hour or two. Well, I shouldn't say that exactly because I lived in St. Paul from going to school back two years, but anyway. I was completely out of my element. Here's this big city with the, you know, the whole bit and all the big city things that you get, and all the temptations and the things because uh, sailors and soldiers were uh, good targets in a sense because, uh, generally speaking, they were there and you could, if you if you hustled them or knocked them out or took their money away from them, they couldn't come back because they had to get back on the base and they never there you disappeared and you disappeared. So it wasn't a matter of very much community. Although I will say that in both Chicago and in uh, Milwaukee, there was no fear of that. Now, San Francisco was a little bit different. There, they'd, they'd lived with sailors for so much and they'd try to take advantage of them. There's all kinds of places there where you couldn't go. I'll deviate here a little bit too, and that is that I stood shore patrol duty in San Francisco. And a shore patrol duty. Uh, involves not only shore patrol, but also uh, where they uh, came in from the ship that's out in the, the bay has a boat or a landing craft that comes into a place on uh, the side of the uh, bay. And it's a floating thing about oh, three or four feet above the water level so that you can get out of the boat or the landing craft or whatever. It's from this ship that's out there bringing these guys in for liberty. Okay, so. Um, again, the same sort of thing. They come back off the ship and they're all in uniform, perfect. So, and 11 o'clock that night, they come back completely drunk and out of their head and so forth. Like and uh, one of the part of the problems that we did, as far as shore patrol duty is concerned, is to uh, keep the sailors when they got out of their uh, head, so to speak. We threw them in the back of a, a, a truck, a pickup truck kind of a thing, but more like a dog catcher type of thing. Just threw them in there like bodily, backed them up to the brig and threw them in the, in the brig. Just treated them like they were sacks of coal and not uh, human beings anymore. Anyway, uh, on top of that, when you're on the shore patrol on these uh, uh, landing craft places where they come into uh, the shore, uh, we had a big, long fish hook type of thing. It's a big thing about a hook like this, like this, to fish them out of the water and stuff because they'd fallen in. And the, the uh, waves in the uh, bay can get quite high. And so what happens is with a landing craft in particular, at the front of the landing craft uh, splashes over. And so there's about this much water and vomit, and you name it, in the bottom of these landing craft. And you, they say, okay, DD, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and, -so, and they come up to there and say, D, 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 so and so, and it's okay, you say, D, 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 what D, D means destroyer, uh, or whatever the ship was out there, the number. And uh, then you get them on, you say, you, D, D, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So you take them and you put them right to the edge of there and just give them a push, throw them in the bottom of this landing craft and all of this stuff. And they take them back to the ship. Oh, man, like I said, that kept me so, I never touched one drop, I never touched one drop of alcohol all the time. I was in, never until uh, maybe, 20 years later that I ever even think about it because uh, I saw what happened. Oh, gee. Anyway, uh, and pr pr protect them from them themselves is what we were doing most of the time. Anyway, those are a little bit of uh, side issues on the thing. Uh, while I'm on the shore patrol, 
the Marines uh, guarded, generally speaking, military prisons. They were usually the ones. And there was a, a military prison on uh, what's called Yerba Buena or Goat Island, which is one of the islands next to Treasure Island. So you go through Yerba Buena or Goat Island before you get to Treasure Island when you get off of the uh, whatever you were on, how you got from San Francisco or Oakland. Anyway, uh, these uh, Marines had to serve the sentence of any person that escaped. So that meant that they didn't like to see somebody escape. So, uh, and uh, Alcatraz is right across the way, you know, so <laughs> Alcatraz is also in the, in the bay. Anyway, uh, so th one night uh, there was a, an escape. I don't know how many guys got out. But there are Marines. When you got off the uh, train, here's Marines with machine guns ready to shoot you at a moment's notice. And anybody that got on there better have a pass because they were looking for the guy. Anyway, uh, then on uh, Camp Shoemaker, where I was, uh, there was a Marine uh, uh, prison there for military, too. And they slept on tents outside. And this was not, this is Northern California, so this is not cool. It was not warm. It is co very cool. And they woke them up in the morning with baseball bats. I mean, they went in there and you know, whacked them. They just, it's time to get up. And everything was devil time. And... Uh, uh, so marine justice, or I shouldn't say marine, military justice is kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> there is, it's not very easy. I, should, I stood a guard in Briggs on the ship, too, and uh, they get uh, full rations every third day. Bread and water uh, once a day and full rations every third day. Well, uh, now... Uh, the way that you get full rations is you take the tray through the chow hall thing and you come back with whatever you got that particular day. And the bread and water is one cup of, it's a, the Navy cups didn't have any handles on, they were kind of heavy. One cup of water and one slice of bread. Bread and water, that's all right. Well, that takes the pep out of a lot of people that have a mischief in their minds. <laughs> <laughs> on top of that, I should say, on Saturday morning when we had uh, muster, general muster uh, for everybody, inspections, they had what they call captain's mast. And they'd read off this and they'd say, okay, so-and-so is AOL, absent over leave. He gets fined so much, he's confined to his quarters and oh, reduced in rank and all that sort of stuff. I went over that, so there is a certain amount of... Uh, of um, you better behave yourself. Keep in mind now that some of these guys that are not us so much in terms of the school thing, we were in the English, but what can you do to a guy that's going to go over on a, on a troop ship and he's going to get sunk maybe on the way over or shot when he gets over there? I mean, what are you going to do to him? You know, uh, okay, shoot me. I don't care. I'm going to get shot anyway. So, so you see, these are not kind of guys that you... Uh, treat gently. Say, so, oh, now, would you please? No, no, no. <laughs> you do uh, whatever it takes. <laughs> and it's the top-down type of thing. Well, anyway, shore patrol duty was that. I short said shore patrol duty in Hawaii later on, too. And it was the same sort of thing. We went to the uh, the local bars and the local places, and as soon as the guys got drunk, we'd load them in and throw them in there and then to ask them where they wanted, what ship they wanted to go on to or what base they were going to to kind of look out at them. So it's not only protecting the sailors from the civilians, but also protecting them from themselves in many cases. Now, was shore patrol sort of a regular rotation for active duty sailors? Or? Yes, well, uh, I was, by this time, I was a, a what to call a uh, enlisted, as an enlisted man, but I was also, uh, I'd been in for now a year and a half or two years, and I was also ranked, you see, with a, with a uh, badge. And so you get the, all kinds of duties. Then uh, uh, Shore Patrol was, was one of them. Uh, I was also what's called Petty Officer of the Watch on board ship. And the, sh the ship I was on, and I'm getting ahead of the game here, but I was on the USS Ajax AR-6, which is a repair ship. It's 880 feet long, and it's filled with every kind of a machinery or anything at all to fix things. So they then uh, fix things by whatever, and there was big lays and machine equipment and anything you needed to fix guns and ships. And 
uh, we, generally speaking, ran, uh, even though the, the war was over, they ran without lights. In other words, you didn't run with your lights on because maybe somebody didn't get the message yet that the war is over. And so, anyway, so we ran with that. And you didn't have a flashlight, and you have little blue lights that at every hatch. Uh, the hatches are the doors. And the hatches don't go all the way to the floor. They go up a ways like that. So you're wending your way, aiming at that little blue light. Now, the ship is pitching like this, and you're going like this, and the ship is like this, and you're trying to make it down there at the end. And the petty officer is a watch that's supposed to keep everybody else awake. There's about four or five watches on both the forward and the aft in, in, in certain places on the sh on board ship. So you're supposed to go around and keep them all awake. So that's part of the job, too, that you get regularly. I stood radar watches, which means you stand and look at a screen here or look at the ranging, that sort of thing. And, uh, now, where was the Ajax? What was its area of coverage? The Ajax started out, well, uh, maybe I should back up. Uh, I graduated, went on uh, leave, came back at Camp Shoemaker, then I was reassigned to USA Ajax. Okay, the Ajax had been at Ulithi in the Philippines and had suffered a little bit of damage because the kamikazes at that time were, now the war is over though, but the, the, the uh, kamikazes had caused a little bit of damage, so they had been in dry dock. Well, if we were the first part of the complement. The complement of the ship is normally about 2,000 men because it's all kinds of people to repair, plumbing and welding, you name it, and electronics. The electronics group was about probably 20 of us. Anyway, anyway so we uh, went on. They took a bunch of us and, and put us on the ship. Well, we were the first ones on the ship after it had been fixed up in dry dock. And that night I got sick. I, uh, I now weigh about 153. And at that time I weighed about 155. And I was really in good, good shape. Uh, uh, because we were eating very well and there was no problems or anything. I got on board. Then first night I was sick. I was so sick for the next three days I could hardly roll over. I w went down to 140 pounds. I lost about 15 pounds in about three or four days. Acute gastroenteritis. I think they said it probably was, I thought it was bad chow or something, you know, maybe it's stuff that still had been on there. Uh, maybe I can back up another step before I do this uh, because at, uh, when I was still at Treasure Island, the uh, fellows that had been on the uh, islands and all of the people that had been out there forever on these islands and, uh, and coming back, we're coming back. And the uh, chow hall where I ate, served 15,000 meals three times a day. <laughs> so there's a big long line like this. You go in about four or five lines like that. And uh, on Sunday, uh, the, we normally, because we were in school, we couldn't stand in line for chow. So, so we would go to the head of the line. And so we would go right to the head of the line, which irritated a lot of people because we had these badges on there. We went right to the head and then went eight and so on. But on Sunday, the chow line was a mile or a mile and a half long, okay. But when they brought these guys back from overseas, they put them at the head of the line because they came back and they were yellow from jaundice, uh, from the atrabine, which is the anti-malarian thing. They had uh, the scrubbiest looking uniforms you ever want to see in your life. Their shoes were all, because jungle rot forms in shoes and so forth. They would cut the things out and make sandals out of them. And they're, they were everything. They were the toughest looking bunch of guys you'd want to see. They fed them 24 hours a day. And for breakfast, you got steak. And for lunch, you got pork chops. And for supper, you got roast beef. And you had all the ice cream, all the fruit, all of everything that you wanted. Well, I'm eating in that same chow hall. Well, uh, I put on, I went from 140 to about 160 pounds in about three months because we were getting regular exercise as well. So, anyway, so then I you know, get a little, get my chronology mixed up here, but anyway, so then I got on the board to shut and I got sicker than that dog. And uh, it's the only time I was ever in sick bay for any, any time I was ever sick at all. And uh, incidentally, in Great Lakes, when I went there to boot camp, a uh, lot of guys were from uh, all kinds of places, you know, like Florida and California and Louisiana and, you know, and they all get pneumonia. And here I am, I think, oh heck, this is the warmest place I've been in the winter. They're getting pneumonia, they're leaving and going there. I managed to not even have any problems with any of that stuff at all. You know, what the heck, this is warm. 
Well, anyway, like I said, I, the only time I ever got sick was this time on, on board ship. Anyway, so now I am on this uh, ship, and we go out to Hawaii, and uh, we're there in the uh, Pearl Harbor for a while, uh, and the, the the ships and everything had some of them had been taken up, but the Arizona was still there, and uh, there was a Japanese. We were tied up right next to a Japanese submarine, the, the one that had uh, come on to the uh, island there when they first. At, at uh, December 7th, there's, uh, they had two uh, submarines that had come in, two, but the, one of them got beached, and this one got beached, and it was tied up alongside. So anyway, it was right there at the submarine base, and uh, this is a little bit off the, off the topic, but uh, I uh, was interested in learning something more. So they had what's called the Armed Forces Institute, which gave you a chance to uh, learn something. So uh, we... Then they said, well, okay, your group is electronics. You should go on the uh, shore and uh, go to this training school. Well, I went there, and heck, the guy didn't know half of what we did already mm -hmm. about this stuff. He was a trainer, and he recognized it right off the bat. He said, okay, you guys don't have to come to class, but he said, if you would bring me some of the components, like transistors and capacitors, and uh, if you start naming it, uh, to use from this class, I'll let you, I'll sign you in as having attended the class. So for uh, about two or three weeks, uh, we went uh, to, quote, class and brought him stuff. Then we went to girls' basketball games, and we went out <laughs> and saw the movies, and we did everything. And we went back to the ship. And sometimes the darn class would get back before we, were, before we did. <laughs> we were in trouble. So I can still remember going up the, the gangway, and you wait because the – I know because the petty officer of the watch made a circle. So I knew what it was. So – when I saw him go, then I waited a little while, then I ran up the gangplank, dropped my ID in the, in the cart, and then went down into my uh, bunk and uh, got in there and laid down like I'd been there all night. <laughs> because they came down looking for guys like me. Anyway, we had, had a lot of fun uh, doing that. And uh, so now I'm on the, on the ship, and uh, we're getting ready to go to the Bikini Atom Bomb site uh, because uh, they were going to test out how the atom bomb would work on a uh, uh, bunch of ships and stuff. And the uh, uh, ships, well, we went out there to the uh, Bikini Atoll. And a Bikini is uh, not very big. It's like the bathing suit type of thing. It's about like that. On board ship, and the board uh, ship where I was on, there was about 35 feet of freeboard. That is from the deck down to the water. And standing on the deck, you could see over the island of Bikini Atoll, you could see over it and see the ocean on the other side. So that it gives you an idea that it isn't very wide and it isn't very high. You could see the water on the other side. And uh, around us now are all kinds of sh uh, ships. And we installed electronic gear of all kinds on them to see how that would uh, respond, if you want to call it that, to uh, the atomic bomb. And they also had animals on the ship, on some of the ships. And the animals uh, were behind gates. And gates normally have a up and down like this and like this. And then they also have a diagonal one to keep it straight. And they had those on board the ship to uh, determine how it would be. They had donkeys and sheep and pigs and uh, goats and I don't know what else. But they had those. Anyway, those were on board the ship. Well, I was out there for a while, and I shouldn't say for how long. I don't know exactly, but uh, only a matter of a, maybe a, a month or so. And uh, because I was uh, scheduled to be discharged, because I'd already been in now for a couple of years, they said, okay, we won't leave you here. We'll send you back to uh, Hawaii because they don't know how it's going to turn out. Uh, I'll, I'll then uh, give you here a little bit again. I was lucky all the way through. I was lucky. First place, I passed the stupid test. I managed to stay in the program, learn something, and managed to stay in it. Uh, I didn't have any, no, I never had any really harm, no harm came to me at all. Uh, when they uh, sent me back to uh, Hawaii, uh, at this time they didn't know about the problem. So they said, well, when they dropped the bomb, turn your back. Well, when they turned your back, they dropped the bomb and splashed water and debris for miles and miles, and all these guys were standing there in the back turn, got all contaminated. Well, 
I'm back and in Hawaii. The Ajax was within that. Oh yeah. Is that close to yeah. the Atoll? Yeah. 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 See, we moved on. Anyway, so I went to, got on a troop transport and went back to Hawaii, and incidentally, I'd been on board. Uh, they went around and we talked and all the Marshall Islands out there and picked up people or all all these islands. And I had been on board ship for a while, so I didn't get seasick. And these troop transports have six decks like this, and they're only about this much between them, and then you're this far away from the next guy, and so on. Really packed in there tight. And uh, these guys are all seasick, and I'm on the bottom bunk, and they're up there, and there's a newspaper down here, and they wouldn't even bother getting out of the bunk. <laughs> like that. Anyway, I, I finally, I, oh. Are we taped? Yeah. Okay. What's pause. it? Stop. Pause okay. Me. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, no, well, no, we'll don't, pause. Don't, yeah, I'll pause. I got that thought maybe, but don't forget where you're. Yeah. Going. No, I, I was, I was avoiding I getting. Need to be mic this time. Uh, you're in these bunks that are six <laughs> high, and you're yeah. the bottom, and the newspaper is below you. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so. Okay. Uh, so you're returning on this troop ship, and continue from there. Yeah, I return that troop ship back to uh, be reassigned to Hawaii, and. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen because they didn't know what was going to happen either in terms of how things were going to go. So anyway, they assigned me to a, a radio transmitter station at Lualua Lei. And Lualua Lei was on the other side of the island from Wahiwa, which is the, the transmitter, uh, the receiver station. So they, over in the receiver station, they would send message over to us to set up a uh, transmitter that would transmit a message to somebody. So there was... I don't know how many transmitters, but literally dozens and dozens of them. The biggest one, and this is AM, amplitude modulated. It's uh, low frequency, it's so it will follow the curvature of the Earth, whereas FM, or frequency modulated, is higher frequency and it has a more line of sight, so it won't go past the uh, horizon. So the amplitude modulated uh, AM transmitters were very powerful. As a matter of fact, there were seven 600-foot towers mm. that carried the wires, that the antenna for that. And on the base, everything was at a code rate. If you had an iron, you were ironing your clothes, it was going da 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 Your toaster went da 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 <laughs> Everything went da 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 uh, The uh, place where I actually worked, you could carry a fluorescent bulb in your hand and it would stay lit all the time, blinking a little bit with a code rate. There was this one uh, that we kept at all, at all of the uh, light switches just taped to the wall that never went off. It, 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 the fluorescent bulbs stayed lit all the time. The amount of RF in the air, in the area, was such that you could stand in front of the transmitter and go like this with your fingers and it would arc the amount of electricity you generate is in your arms would arc between the ends of your fingers. Every, Were you concerned about this? I mean, its effect on your health? It didn't affect me a bit, didn't affect oh, me good. a bit, didn't affect me a bit, didn't affect me a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, these people that worry about such things now, man, the amount that I was exposed to and the radar uh, watches that I stood and all that kind of stuff, uh, if it did, I don't know what it did. But anyway, people do get concerned about it. Uh, you know, their, oh, their cell phone or something. Oh, man, if I was going to be affected by it. A radar uh, is the precursor of our microwave. And a radar beam that went past a mast that stood up would peel the paint off that uh, mast uh, over time. So mm. it, they're very, very powerful uh, <laughs> things. And they're, they're even more powerful uh, now. These newer ones are even more powerful. Anyway, uh, so when you maintain this transmitter, like I said, you opened the door and walked into it. The tubes that, for it, these are all vacuum tubes. This is before transistors. It's all vacuum tubes. They each, in some cases, had their own individual cooling system. They had uh, maybe a, a jacket about four feet long that, that kept it cool because the amount of heat that it generated was so much that each one of them had their own water jacket to cool them. Huh. And uh, anyway, uh, we uh, uh, stood eight hours on and eight hours off and eight hours on eight hours off for, for two days and then we had the third day off. So you're constantly changing your sleeping and eating habits. It just completely... This is uh, in the uh, kind of the, the southwest uh, corner of... Uh, southeast corner of Oahu. And uh, the whole thing was a 
so it was a uh, radio base so that it was not there was no uh, uh, civilians or anything else around and so we went down to the beach and uh, and on our day off and we had flippers and a few things like that and you go out there with a snorkel and go around like that well in some days uh, the surf was higher than others and the for this particular day and I remember it very well the surf was coming up a lot more than usual and the beach was not a nice sloping beach it was a quite steep so it went from here to maybe uh, 20 or 30 feet high in not more than say a, a couple hundred feet at the most so it was quite a steep beach and uh, then out in the uh, ocean is a uh, coral uh, you know the cor coral is very sharp and all that sort of stuff well uh, I had paddled around out there and there was I was out there pretty much by myself and right next to this beach was these uh, what's it called blowholes they're uh, rock formations in which the wave comes in and shoots uh, 20, 30 feet in the air through a hole and it does that every time a wave comes in. And so that's a dangerous. And so I'm out there, I paddle around. I said, oh, okay, I'm getting tired now, I'll come back in. Well, I came back in and the waves would take me up. And then because the waves hit you at your knee level on the way down, take me back down and roll me over, head over, take me back down and onto the coral. Huh? So you're getting your arms, your head, your knees, oh. your elbow, everything. And this dad did about two or three times. I finally got a little panicky. I thought, I'm going to drown out here. Yeah. Uh, and I darn near did. Anyway, I went out into the ocean where it's a little calmer then and then came back in. And I finally made it back in uh, that particular time. But that's as close as I've come to having any. I could have drowned easily out there. <laughs> to, to, to harm. Ironic. Yeah, right. Anyway, so now I'm stationed at Lua Lua Lay. And uh, we go into and we're around to the places and we're out in the middle of pineapple places and pineapples go right up the road is here and two feet over is pineapples so once in a while sailors would ac accidentally knock a pineapple off and have to take it well the pineapple growers took a very dim view of that sort of thing <laughs> and so you had to be kind of careful I lived in a, a barracks kind of arrangement it's very a very nice thing because we were all on our on our own so to speak we had to be there at the station uh, all the time and uh, I've described the uh, way that it was done because uh, they we would get a message from the Wahiwa uh, base and they would say set up transmitter so-and-so for this one and so on like that and then uh, when we did this you had to key in a message of some kind to know because to set up a transmitter you need to set up a whole series of things it's a quite a complicated procedure and then you key, and you key a signal, and you're sending a signal out that's going out. So as it's left over from uh, wartime, it was sent out Vs. So you da 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 I've sent out 10 million Vs uh, setting up these <laughs> transmitters. Well, okay, so now the, uh, I'm, my time is up. They said, okay, you're back to uh, the base, uh, back to uh, where you got uh, inducted or in, in enlisted and this is in Minneapolis so I go back to Treasure Island and there again then go on a train and go back to uh, Minneapolis St. Paul and on the uh, Sunday morning well I should back up a little bit there's a quite a little rigmarole in getting discharged to give you a physical to make sure you're not carrying something back into civilian life and get your reasonable shape and all that sort of stuff so they don't come back to you later and then they uh, uh, lined us all up for our last um, muster and on Sunday morning 11 o'clock they lined us all up and we were supposed to be discharged so they said okay you are discharged you're reassigned because the, they were getting a little bit worried about the Korean War and they had 11 months invested in us yeah. their schooling and so they didn't want to turn us loose again and have to go back and get us so they said okay you're reassigned and you're you're discharged and you're reassigned they uh, reassigned three-fourths of them and one-fourth of them got Discharge. I'm one of those that got discharged. I thought, oh boy, made it, made it lucky again. I didn't, I didn't have any problems any place. Nobody shot at me. No, no problems anybody. Anyway, so I then get on a streetcar, go to the bus depot, and uh, eat in the cafeteria there. And uh, I'm not used to uh, civilian life, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, I will. I'll have to admit that 
uh, the uh, girls started looking pretty good, and the girls were looking at me. I thought, well, hey, what this? You know, here I'm a sailor. Cause there, there's some, uh, some things about sailors anyway. And my wife says, I, and I really was, she says, you're a little boy in a sailor's uniform. I was 18. <laughs> I, weighed, I weighed about 130 pounds. I was about five feet two, something like that. Anyway, so anyway, I get on the bus and go, go to St. Cloud. That's about 75 miles from the after St. Paul. I uh, hitchhike from St. Cloud to Foley, which is another uh, 15 miles or so. This is Sunday, and I then walk the two and a half miles from Foley home and walk into the house at home and I say, oh, good to see you home. And uh, Did they know you were coming? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I, that's the funny thing about this now. I never called home once. I wrote letters often. Incidentally, on the letter thing, you had supposed to write letters often. I sent uh, them all home, and my mother saved every one of them in a shoebox. And so uh, all of them are sent down to an archives in uh, Florida State. There's a fellow by the name of Olston down there that has a archives of all that kind of stuff. And so I sent that, and I sent that slide rule that I talked yeah, about us, yeah. to uh, down there. And uh, while I'm on that subject, I read the letters over 50 years later. Some I, I've never seen them because my wife, um, oh no, my mother, I should say, my mother kept them. And then when my mother died, my sister went in the boxes and stuff. Oh, here's some stuff from, from Phil from when he was in the service. So it was to send down to me. So I read them 50 years later. And uh, the tone in there was, even though I was not in any risk, was constantly reassuring them between the lines that everything was all right. Because my father had been in a really bad situation. And so I was... Indirectly, I say, oh, everything's going fine, even though it, it wasn't going that well. I have a daughter that when we asked her how she was doing in school, fine. How'd you do in math? Oh, I got a D. Uh, how you doing in math? Fine. D. How you doing in English? Oh, I got a D. How you doing? Fine. <laughs> well, I was the same way. I, I was saying, oh, I'm doing fine when things weren't going so well. And I never did say anything about bad. It was always uh, kind of reassuring. It's, it's, it's a funny reading that th these things 50 years later because I kind of remember the uh, feeling that I had when I was doing this. Anyway, I uh, walked in and I sat down and had supper and said, oh, good to see you back. And <laughs> the next morning, this is Monday morning, I'm out pitching bundles at, in the thrash machine because my father had a thrash machine and he went around thrashing. So I was out there and that was the end of it. I, these people who say, oh, nobody gave me a hero's welcome or anything. And the heck, I got a hero's welcome. They got a hero's welcome. Here's the pitchfork. Go to work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, one of the things that you mentioned before that I that I was going to say, uh, uh, quite aside from the, my experience, uh, since that time I have been. Uh, I lived in England for a year. Lived in Germany for a year. I've been to Hawaii. I've been to a number of places. And uh, when I was in England, we went to the military cemetery in Cambridge. And uh, then when we were in Germany, we went to. Uh, the one, there's one in Arnheim, and, uh, and then these, these are American military cemeteries, and then there's one at Maastricht or Margraten, and then there's one in uh, uh, Oahu, uh, uh, Honolulu. And uh, if you've never been to a military cemetery, it should be done. Yeah, it's very good to do this. Uh, one of the things that impressed me as much as anything is two of them, one at Arnheim and one at... Uh, Margraten. Margraten is right at the intersection of uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and uh, France, and so on. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was a big tank, tank battle there. It's 8,000 crosses, so there's a lot of people. Anyway, uh, it's a memorial, and there's a wall like this, like this, three-sided, and it's about 20 feet tall, and it's in tile, and it all shows the, the battle, how it went, and all that sort of thing. And then it's open on the other side, and then there's uh, the cemetery itself, and that's all there is to it. And the particular day that we were there, uh, there were hundreds of people there, and they were not Americans. They were from every place else. And uh, then there's a place to sign in. And the thing that uh, impressed me as much as any is that... Uh, the recurring theme in there was, we are eternally grateful to the Americans for what they did to help us. This is written by the French and also by Germans, but it's what they, in the Dutch. But what really impressed me was it's all young people. It's mm. is it 20 years old and so forth. They still, they have it. 
uh, when we were in, uh, now we had three boys with us when we were in, in Germany. We stopped at a, a little place near Arnheim. And they have a little sign that says uh, bed and board and that sort of stuff. And so we thought, okay, we'll stay there because we never paid any reservation. We just, I'm like this boarding, we just don't pay any reservation. We just go there and we see a sign. So we went there and, and said, uh, do you have a room? They said, well, this is Saturday night. He said, no, uh, we don't operate on Saturday night. He said, but you're American, aren't you? I said, yes. Of course, you can't hide your American. So anyway, he said, uh, just a minute. And they only had two or three rooms uh, in their little inn, so to speak. He said, just a minute, and he said, went around and talked to his wife. He said, okay, uh, we'll fix it. So we stopped there, and we, he said, put us upstairs. And a half hour after we'd been there, they went up and came, said, come down. So they came down, and they fed us mm. and uh, uh, talked with us. And uh, he said uh, about something about the military cemetery. I said, oh, yes. And he said, uh, when the Americans came in, put up the cemetery, they went into Arnheim to hire people to maintain the cemetery. Because military cemeteries are maintained very well. Anyway, uh, they wouldn't uh, work for them. We will maintain the cemetery, but we will not work for you. We will maintain the cemetery free forever. And that's the way it's been. Mm. In uh, Italy, we always think of Italy as being on the, quote, other side. Well, in Italy, there's bronze plaques every place that says, we are eternally grateful to the Americans for freeing us from the occupiers and so on. Oh. So uh, there's a little bit different. Now, we were in Germany. We had a German car, and we had probably German-looking clothes, and so we drove through France. They shake their fist at you and swear at you in, in, uh, in French, swear at you. Wash, <laughs> and in uh, Yugoslavia, there's still a sign there that said, uh, "Deutschland nicht willkommen." Uh, Germany's not welcome, and so on like that. So there's a lot of that. In Holland, you were um, automatically good because you're American. In uh, Denmark, you're automatically good because you're American, and so on. We lived in Germany when the Iron Curtain was up, so we had some experience with that a little bit too. And uh, so we, we saw how that was. And uh, at that time, there were 250,000 American occupiers in Germany. And uh, we played racquetball in uh, courts because uh, the military had uh, racquetball courts and we played in this. So uh, I've had some experience with that sort of thing after that. And probably I've told more than I needed to. But anyway, if you have questions or whatever or comments, uh, I gotta try to answer them. I think you've been very thorough. Um, and you've given us a nice chance to f how you felt as you look back on this and at the aftermath when you've been had a chance to visit some of these countries affected by the war years later. Do you have any concluding thoughts about your, your experiences and those of your colleagues? Or? Yeah, people can look back on it now, you know, and they say, well, bring your hands. Oh, one of the, there's a particular one fellow that says, oh, we shouldn't have dropped those bombs on Japan because they were ready to quit. Well, if they were ready to quit, they could have quit 10 times. You could have dropped after the first bomb, they could have quit. But uh, they didn't, and, and their experiences. And I was on the West Coast when there's all these guys were getting ready to go, and I was one of those guys. The fact they dropped those atomic bombs and stopped the war by killing a bunch of civilians and whatever else happened, because there was no, uh, in the, this Ken Burns thing, they also showed there was no civilians and whatever. Like Dresden, they bombed Dresden. I don't know if you get into that. Or bombed Tokyo. They bombed Dresden and, and Tokyo, both with firebombs, and killed as many people as were killed with the atomic bomb. And so uh, that particular thing, I don't, I don't wring my hands over the fact that there are a number of people killed. It, as far as I was concerned, it's better them than me, and I was one of those that was scheduled to be one of those guys that was going to go there and do this, and they were expecting a million casualties, and I don't see any way around it because they died to the last one on all these islands, every one of the islands. I saw one Japanese POW, one, and he was the guy that got stranded in this uh, submarine. He just wandered around the base where I was. Nobody paid any attention to him. I saw oh hundreds of, of German POWs on Treasure Island, Incidentally, I'll tell a story on them. Uh, they, were, they had been captured in uh, North Africa, and uh, 
they were, had been pretty elite type of uh, guys. And uh, they worked in the chow halls and they worked in the ship service and they worked in the laundry and the f cobbler areas and they fixed up and cleaned up and so on. Because they were stuck on Treasure Island, the war was still going on, so they didn't send them back yet. Anyway, so uh, they would go to work at uh, night, usually, in March. In the no there, here's uh, the difference between uh, Americans and, and somebody else. Here's some old sailor with a shotgun over his arm, one sailor with about four or 500 German POWs. Uh -huh. And German POWs are going, pump, 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 and they turn perfect, march perfectly, perfectly in time. And they did it perfectly, okay? And uh, so uh, when uh, we would march, we had marched, we were supposed to march to class. So we were marching in groups of about mm, maybe 40, so our half a company was 40. And the first guys might be in line and might be in step, and one or two guys might be in step or in line, but the rest of us was just kind of, we're walking to class. <laughs> so it to. And they were, they'd been there long enough to, to uh, speak English quite well. They say, get in step, get in step, get lined up, get lined up. We say, yeah. Get look where it got you. And look where it got you. We had to come back. <laughs> so it was, it, we had to come back. Uh, when we were in uh, Germany, we went to a uh, birthday of a little village, Amdorf. Amdorf was, I don't know, four or five or six hundred years old. It, it was their birthday. And the particular place we went to, it, the barn and the house and all that was all the, the one kind of unit, one Kind of in a courtyard in the middle, and they had the birthday party in there. So we went there to just see what it was like. And of course, Americans just show up. And the host, of the one who lived there, uh, came up and he was effusive. And he said, Oh, uh, Americans, uh, Roosevelt Primo, which meant <laughs> number one. He, uh, he said, Ich bin ein Guest von Roosevelt. I was a guest of Roosevelt. Hmm. Yeah. He's a prisoner of war. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he said, he said uh, 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 one of the best times in his life, he said he was a prisoner of war. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, well, in the area where I grew up, there was a lot of truck gardening, uh, carrots and onions and potatoes. And because uh, my father sold potatoes by the carload to, to places. Uh, that's, uh, anyway, and so they had a lot of German and Italian POWs there that looked out after the mm. stuff and there was nobody watched them they just they worked at, they worked there and that's what the end of it and then when the war was over they and back so uh, there's a lot of people that had uh, good impressions of that uh, on another t uh, side of a topic a little bit unrelated uh, I belong to the Cambridge Club which is those people that had spent a year or so at Cambridge the University in England and it consisted of all the people that had gotten their degrees at Cambridge. Well, I was at a meeting in Munich in uh, about 1972, and there, were, there was a meeting of the Cambridge Club, which I was a member of. But there was an M.C. Chang who came from China. There was a Measure Schmidt from Germany. There was a Solomon from Hungary. There was another one from uh, someplace else. And anyway, uh, we went to one of these uh, uh, cellars, 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 and uh, started out the, the evening, and then everybody was telling stories. And these all guys had been uh, associated with Cambridge, and they were all old enough so they had been experienced in the uh, Second World War. And uh, Chang was uh, Chinese, and he was in uh, Cambridge, and uh, he came to the United States, and uh, they wouldn't do anything with him because he was Chinese. They wouldn't send him back to China because Chinese regimen had changed, the regimen had changed, and he'd go back there, he'd been killed, so they kept him here in the United States. So he told a few stories about things. Measure Schmidt was a more interesting one, and a fellow named Solomon. Measure Schmidt had been at Cambridge, and he had been interested in racing horses, and he spent most of his time at Newmarket, which is the racehorse capital. This in. was when he was a prisoner? Or? Yeah, no, no, when he was a student. Oh, my when gosh. A student. See, oh, this oh yes, right. Okay, so now, he, okay, we've got to back up. He, he's a student at Cambridge. Okay. You see, all these people are students. Anyway, so he then uh, uh, was, uh, after he got uh, out of school in Cambridge, he went uh, to uh, Germany, and they sent him to Argentina because he was a uh, PhD, and he and about, oh, something like 30 or 40 others 
there were physicians and bankers and every kind of a educated and talented person. They sent him to Argentina to kind of set up a kind of a, uh, a German out, <laughs> outpost, so to speak. And, uh, okay, I'll back up one, one more step. A fellow uh, in uh, Connecticut captured a young German Nazi. And uh, the young German spoke perfect English. And he said, where are you from? And he said, he, the, the fellow from Connecticut told him where he was from. He said, oh, yes, I know the highway that goes through there. He had know everything about that. This young fellow had been already trained to be a occupier of this town in Connecticut, oh. even when he was only about 14 or 15. Oh. Uh, well, okay, anyway, well, as long as I'm telling this guy's story, I'll back off another one and rind it. Uh, <laughs> When we were in Germany, there's German uh, war uh, cemeteries too, military cemeteries, and there's military cemeteries in Ger of in Ireland of Germans. There's a German uh, military cemetery in Ireland because Ireland was so opposed to Britain that they harbored a German people that if they if their plane went down, go to Ireland, they'll land, they'll, they'll look after it because they so opposed to the, the mm. Irish are so opposed to the uh, British that they would <laughs> favor the, uh, them. In, uh, so there's a German uh, military cemetery in Ireland, which mm. I visited. Anyway, uh, back to uh, uh, Marines, it was a town that I was in, as a small, very small uh, town. And there was a, a number of uh, military crosses in there. And uh, because they were the last part of the Germany that was uh, taken over, the ages of the people on the uh, crosses uh, were 14, 15, 16 at the most, even some down to 13. And then they started at about 50. There was no in between. They, they, were, they were down to only the very, very young and the very, very old. And those were the crosses were still in the military cemeteries there in mm. Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, are you going to finish the Argentine contingent? Yeah. Story? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a long one. Argentina. No, he went down long. there with a bunch of guys. Also, they then they got together. Argentina was kind of neutral, but the neutrality extends out only to the uh, about three mile limit, right? Mm. Out there, it's the open sea. So now we got. Uh, all of these guys. So they get together and they buy a ship. Buy a ship. And they uh, fit it up and they practice in the three mile limit of, of uh, running it up and down. But they notice that there's a British destroyer that runs up and down the outside, kind of patrols that to see to it that they don't get into trouble and so on like that. And you know, Anyway, so they have, these, uh, here's the physicians, he said, we had white uh, cuffed uh, shirts on with cufflinks and we're taking gobs of grease and sticking it in the gears to make the ship go with <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Anyway, he said we practiced and practiced and we timed that, that uh, destroyer every time it went by and so we practiced very hard. So we get out, we're going to go back to Germany and help Germany, right? Okay. So they get it together and they see the destroyer go down and time it and so on. They get out. They don't get more, out more than about two or three miles beyond it and the destroyer comes along and says, Stop, and they shoot a one across the bow, stop. And they had one guy that spoke Dutch, and, and he spoke Russian. And so they said, okay, no, we're a, we're a Dutch thing. <laughs> they, <laughs> you know, the semaphores and the signals and all this sort of thing. They, the British destroyer said, we know who you are and who's on board, and don't give us any shit, so to speak. <laughs> we, we know who you are and what you're up to. You can either stop or we'll sink you. And so they stopped. They captured them and they put them back. They took them back to England. And they took them back to Newmarket <laughs> and put them in that a prison of war camp in Newmarket. Well, heck, they didn't last more than two minutes in there because they spoke perfectly good English. They knew the environment perfectly well. They got out and wandered around in, uh, all through Britain for a while <laughs> until they got caught up again. So this time they put them on a, 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 a ship and sent them for us to, they're going to send them to Australia. So they sent them first to Canada. Well, before they got to Canada, the, the German torpedo sunk the ship that they were on, and they ended up in the water, and they got then saved by the uh, other uh, Canadian uh, ship. So anyway, they uh, 
they uh, put them on a train, and each one of them had one item of clothing. They had either an overcoat or a pair of pants or a shirt or something. Each one of them had one, one item of clothing, and that was the item of clothing that they had until they got on board this, this uh, train going across Canada. So they went across Canada, went around the other side, and went down to Australia. Well, okay, they went down to Australia, and this is uh, early in the uh, war, and they set up a prisoner war camp down there. Of course, where are they going to go? No place. So they set up their own camp. They had their own city, and they had their own racetrack. They had their own bedding. They had their own bank. They had their own grocery store. All these are German POWs down there. And when the war was over, they didn't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> they had it so good down there. Uh, okay, that's him. He finally got back. He was at the uh, Minister of Agriculture at, uh, in Germany at the, at the time, so he uh, made it up pretty good. <laughs> anyway, so Solomon, Steve Solomon, and I don't know exactly all of the details. I don't remember him, but all I do is know he was Hungarian. That's first. So Hungarians, Hungarians were fighting against the Germans. So then the Germans captured him, and then they said, okay, you could be on our side. So then he, he manned an anti-aircraft gun. So he was shooting at American planes, and then the, uh, he got uh, captured by American. Then he got captured again by the Italians. He was in an Italian prisoner war camp for a while. Then he got out of that. He went back again, and he was out shooting for the Americans. Well, he, he was shooting for them for a while. Then the uh, Russians captured him, and he got then back into Russia. He was in a Russian prisoner war camp. Anyway, he, and in the meantime, he, uh, when he was in Russia, he uh, went to his civil engineering uh, program and f finally then ended up with a, a degree, and uh, they uh, let him go. And he went into then uh, Australia, and he was then a reproductive physiologist, frozen uh, ram semen and some of that. So he had a really a wild background. He said, I, first I would shoot at the Americans, and then I would have American guns, and I would shoot at the Germans, and then the Germans would shoot at... He, he <laughs> shot at all times. The Hungarians were <laughs> whoever it was. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, and uh, the, others were, the others were interesting. These are all people that have been, thing, been places and done things, you see. It was very interesting. I didn't have much to add because I said, oh, I was in school all the time. Well, what did you have to say? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that neatly brings us back full circle yeah. mm -hmm. to where we started. Yeah. So thank you again, Phil, okay. and uh, it's been a joy to interview you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to, to relate it. It's funny how it's a lot of stuff back, even though I don't have a script or anything. I, it comes back, not necessarily in order, but uh, one thing led to another. Very articulately. Thank you. Yeah. Don't get up until we take our microphones off. Okay. Yeah, that's that's part of it. Yeah, because we talked about it. we were going to yeah. do the other thing, uh, like this program.